Good morning to all the audience, or good afternoon, or good evening, because this is a worldwide broadcast uh, from the Institute of Advanced Studies in Kreseg. And uh, in our podcast and uh, broadcast series, uh, today's uh, guest is uh, Susanna Marka from the University of Columbia, who is an ast astrophysicist. And uh, I'm Gerge Toth, uh, working in the Institute of Advanced Studies. And, uh, uh, only have a, a, a very small insight to the questions of the astrophysics, but uh, I find it a, a very interesting subject, which uh, I believe attracts a lot of interest from the broader audience as well. So I'm very happy uh, to talk today uh, to Zuzanna, and uh, I ask uh, you if you can please say a few words about yourself uh, before we enter to the conversation about your subject. Yes. So, I'm a research scientist at the Columbia Astrophysics Laboratory. It's at Columbia University in the city of New York. So, I live in the United States and in this great city of New York. Uh, I was educated in Hungary, uh, in Debrecen, and I did my PhD in Nashville at the Vanderbilt University. And had several different positions, and now I am working on astrophysics at Columbia. Uh, I left Hungary uh, decades ago, but it's after uh, certainly the changes. Uh, I graduated in 93, and I wanted to see the world, do my PhD, and then ended up uh, staying in the United States since it has amazing opportunities for those who love science and want to do science. And generally, physics is an expensive uh, science, uh, requires very large-scale instrumentation, which is certainly not easy to support in, in small countries, at least the type of science I am doing, which is uh, gravitational wave astrophysics. I am part of the LIGO scientific collaboration and probably you remember that in 2015 we discovered the gravitational waves from two merging black holes uh, and we announced this in 2016 and in 2017 this led to the Nobel Prize of uh, my senior colleagues uh, within the LIGO scientific collaboration, which is like more than 1,000 scientists. So this is a great discovery. Uh, we have the others who certainly did the, uh, establish the basics of the field, who were awarded uh, prizes, but they also say that it's 1,000 people work, and I am definitely honored to be part of this great accomplishment in science, which is booming since then. So it was just the opening of a, of a great field, which we would call gravitational wave astronomy now. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. I think this is uh, extremely interesting. And you already uh, mentioned two uh, keywords or two subjects, the gravitational waves and the black holes, which uh, uh, are somehow mysterious for the, I think, for the people like myself, who has only a, a distant knowledge about, uh, about this. And, uh, uh, but I, I, I also read a lot about uh, uh, that in the media, in the, in the, in the public media. That uh, maybe before uh, we enter to the details of that, can we uh, go back a little bit to your uh, PhD? So where uh, this all started from? Because I, I believe your uh, physical uh, edu uh, physics education uh, was a general uh, physics uh, education in a university in Hungary. But when you went to the US and you started your PhD, uh, what was uh, the subject there? Uh, which then, I believe, uh, uh, led you to the way to the group uh, which then discovered the gravitational waves. So I sort of feel like I am a physicist who knows a little bit about a lot of subfields of physics, but originally actually I'm a chemist. I have a chemistry degree <laughs> from Debrecen and I did my PhD in physics. So originally my interest was in physical chemistry. It grew into an interest in physics. Uh, in physics, I was doing my PhD in nonlinear optics. We can just say optics. Uh, 
now optics is a gate great coupling into LIGO science. Again, I mentioned LIGO is the Laser Interferometer Gravitational Wave Observatory. Certainly, we are using optics uh, principles to detect gravitational waves. So that was a great coupling. At the end, I am not really doing much optics within LIGO, but I was always interested in instruments. I was uh, the leader of uh, the team which built the timing system for LIGO. It has some optics in because we are using optical fibers. And this, this is basically the system which is responsible to sending precise timing ticks to each part of the detector. And also it's providing the precise timestamp time for our detected. Uh, the, our data and, of course, the detected signals. So I definitely ha can say that I put instruments into the LIGO detectors and I, if I visit the site, I can point at them, oh, this is coming from our group. So certainly it's one of those things I am uh, definitely proud of. In the, well, actually not just in the past few years, but since 2006 or so, I've been also very active in data analysis within LIGO and uh, I am currently responsible and I, I, I am part of the short, small team who started this work um, and it's a specific analysis of the data which relates to multi-messenger astrophysics. In this case the messengers are certain gravitational waves and the other type of messenger I am interested in and looking for joint sources with are neutrinos. So imagine there is an astrophysical uh, event somewhere out there in the cosmos. Let's say uh, two neutron stars colliding because this is one of those events which we know and have made detections. And if uh, such an event we know, they are giving out gravitational waves. In 2017, we learned that uh, these gravitational waves can come together with gamma ray bursts. And also there are optical signatures which are also observable. We call them kilonovae these type of optical signatures which come with uh, the uh, gravitational wave and uh, for example the gamma ray emission together from these sources. There's one thing which we haven't seen yet and they are the neutrino counterparts to this process and that's what I am searching for and I hope we will discover such when we see a particle and gravitational wave emission together. So. This is a current interest of mine, and uh, this is what leads to us uh, to somewhat the topic of, of uh, how we can use astrophysics to uh, talk about uh, events in, in, in out there in the cosmos, but also, for example, in everyday uh, life, which can connect uh, definitely known events uh, which happened, we call them detections in astrophysics, to something which are just chance coincidences. So mm -hmm. what I'm asking every day uh, when we're running this analysis is if I see a gravitational wave and a neutrino uh, around the same time in different detectors obviously, uh, coming from around the same region of the sky. Uh, are they coming from the same astrophysical source or they are just chance coincidences and they are unrelated detection? Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. So uh, I see that it was a perfect match uh, of your uh, past education and then uh, your activities in the group uh, that you have a broad understanding uh, both of the uh, underlying processes and also uh, how to measure these processes. And uh, the processes themselves are those uh, happening in the, in the cosmos, uh, either the, uh, the events uh, related to the black holes movement or, uh, or uh, other uh, 
uh, such a large scale events, which you can uh, detect uh, in, in, in the ground, in, in our Earth. Uh, and this is uh, uh, something which uh, I think is very, very difficult uh, for someone to, uh, to, to understand its magnitude and also its, uh, its, its, its small scale. So because these events uh, happen on an extremely large scale, uh, but the effect to be detected uh, can only be uh, seen in a, in a very, very small scale. So your jumping in between the scales is something which is enormous. Uh, and I also know that uh, by your understanding and by the general understanding of your group, uh, you were able to, to build this uh, uh, instrument uh, which uh, is able actually to, to detect uh, these uh, gravitational waves. Uh, which uh, of, of which the, uh, the the finding or exploration was uh, one of the uh, one of the greatest uh, scientific achievement in the 21st century. Uh, can you please uh, tell us a few words about uh, the the basic uh, principles of the gravitational waves and then uh, the basic principle of the instrument? Uh, which uh, is able to detect uh, those gravitational waves. So first, maybe a little bit about the, uh, the theory behind and the, the basic physics behind the gravitational waves, and then uh, a, a, a little bit uh, explanation about the instrument itself. All right, so gravitational waves were predicted by Einstein back in 1916. Um, he also predicted that we will never be able to detect them because it's so difficult to build an instrument that would be uh, sensitive to such a small scale. So in terms of what waves are, we can all use the analogy if we drop a stone or a rock into a pond, we start to see uh, waves in a circular uh, motion developing and moving outward. So we do have this sort of everyday understanding what waves are. And in this case, we have a medium, which would be the water, uh, and they would react to the disturbance of, of these rocks. Now, in terms of gravitational waves, um, what I can say in terms of me analogy again, uh, medium, that would be something which we call the space-time, which is surrounding us. The way you can think about space-time, if we have a massive object, it curves the space. And you know, we have to add that additional time into that. Um, it curves the space around this, around us. So it, Earth is having a more curved space-time than what we can find around the moon because the Earth is more massive. If we have a much more compact object like a black hole, that curvature is much greater. So objects move, move in this space-time and follow uh, this space-time. So if there is a very heavy black hole, the space-time curves so much around it that the objects move on a way that it's, it's an even more curved signature around the very heavy black hole. For example, light can go around. That's another light is also, you think it always moves around a straight line in our everyday life. That's what we see here on Earth. But certainly if we have a curved space time, it follows the curvature. So what are gravitational waves? Because right now I just said, oh, space time looks around a, a massive object. Uh, it curves, a massive object curves the uh, space-time. But we can have ripples on these space-times, and those are gravitational waves. So if we imagine, for example, two objects, let's call them right now black holes, and they move around each other in this fashion, they actually start speeding up. And we can kind of think that they are uh, rippling up this fabric of space-time. So that's what gravitational waves are. They are ripples on the fabric of space-time, and the two black holes start to go faster and faster uh, around each other. They actually are releasing these gravitational waves. At the end, they m move so fast that it's getting closer to the speed of light, and then they merge, a fraction of the speed. 
flight, then they merge. And then the space-time basically becomes calm, and that previous gravitational wave uh, signature radiated outward, and depending on how far away from Earth uh, this uh, black hole merger happened, it will take uh, uh, millions, billions of light years to, to reach us, these signatures to reach us. And what we detect here, a tiny signature, as you said, so we are detecting displacement of the mirrors in LIGO, which are around the order of 10 to minus uh, 19 meters. This is the fraction of a, the side of the uh, atomic nucleus. So it's really tiny and it's certainly mind-boggling to be able to uh, make such a measurement which can uh, uh, measure displacements of that uh, size. Uh, we are using laser interferometry for that. And we are using the laser interferometry uh, because light, as we know, there are also waves, electromagnetic waves. Uh, in an interferometer, we can think about uh, the lights are meeting on a way that the, where they join. <laughs> If the lights are coming from two arms of, the, of our detectors, when they meet, they can join in a way that the uh, added light becomes much larger, but they can also join this way. And we get basically a, a condition when, that we are getting no light, like a dark condition. So we are using this phenomenon of interferometry uh, to measure the, this displacement. There are lots of tricks how we can measure displacement at the order of 10 to minus 19, which is a fraction of the uh, around one micron uh, size of the uh, laser wavelengths which we are using. And you know, this is what took tens of years of development for the LIGO team. And let me add one more thing. Uh, LIGO, as I said earlier, is, is certainly more than 1,000 mm, people, and we also have international collaborators. Uh, there's a Virgo detector in, in Italy. There's a Kagra detector in Japan. We have great Indian partners, Australian partners. There's a small-scale detector in Germany as well. So this is a huge international effort to um, put together the principles of gravitational wave detections. And then, of course, the US team, uh, which was funded by the National Science Foundation, made the first such detection, and, uh, uh, which is based on the principles of, of, of many if before us. And, 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 and certainly, we have uh, great scientists who, who are working with us, uh, and they are not on the younger scale. They put their full life, basically, in, into this project. Uh, I am, and certainly uh, a lot of us are sort of like the mid-range in age and when we joined this project, but there was a lot of previous effort. But certainly, uh, I'm proud that I could put some instruments into LIGO and, and our team at Columbia could do that. Mm -hmm. uh, very interesting, and uh, I, I learned that uh, uh, the, uh, the the scale or the uh, let's say the size of this uh, gravitational wave uh, compared to uh, the size of the uh, Milky Way <laughs> or uh, a system of <laughs> part of the universe is uh, is uh, such that the if you put uh, next to the Milky Way a basketball, uh, that is the, uh, the, 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 the size uh, which you are looking for. So uh, you, can, you can compare uh, uh, the, uh, let's say, these scales together, like the Milky Way and the basketball, uh, which you want to uh, find 
on uh, the earth. And uh, I also learned uh, that that instrument which uh, you, you built in the US is, uh, is uh, quite large, you know, human scale, like a four uh, kilometer uh, large uh, vacuum uh, tube, uh, which is the, 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 like the basic nutshell uh, for the instrument. And uh, at the uh, end of this uh, tube uh, are those uh, mirrors which then able to detect uh, the waves of, uh, of uh, a frequency of one hertz or so, or 10 hertz of so, or so. So uh, these are the, the smallest frequencies uh, uh, which uh, so far uh, have been uh, detected on Earth. And these are the so smallest frequencies which actually released by this uh, uh, black hole uh, movements. So uh, uh, the point here for me, which is interesting, that uh, this instrument, uh, which is capable to, to, to detect that uh, very small uh, signature, uh, needed to be really uh, thought over many times uh, before installed. Uh, can you uh, tell us a few words about that process, how this instrument was built and, uh, and uh, what were the, maybe the most difficult and the most enjoyable uh, moments uh, during the uh, installation of this instrument? Uh, sure. So the LIGO interferometers and generally ground-based gravitational wave interferometers are sensitive from around 10 hertz up to a few kilohertz uh, region. And uh, of course they will be able to be sensitive in this region uh, for one main reason is that our gravitational wave source is where the binary neutron stars uh, collide and merge and also where binary black holes of these uh, few solar masses to tens of solar masses merge they happen to uh, to do this in this frequency regime there are gravitational waves which are in lower in frequencies but unfortunately you cannot build them here on earth because we have a seismic uh, wall which we just can't really go around, you know, there's always a continuous seismic uh, noise which is coming, you know, we are on Earth. It's not just earthquakes themselves, those are the huge transients, but we can get rid of them, at least we can even decide just not analyzing our data around if there's an earthquake uh, which comes by and, and, uh, and uh, certain leaves, it's uh, footprint in, in our detectors because they do. Uh, but there's the general seismic noise which is, is, is impossible to get rid of. So there are plans even for space antennae mm -hmm. which will be... Uh, I think it will be flying around 2034 and they will be looking for mergers of much more bigger uh, uh, black holes, uh, they, they would be like 10 to the 5, 10 to the 6 solar masses. So these are the type of uh, black holes which would be like there is one, although it's alone, <laughs> uh, at the center of our own my, uh, Milky Way. So in terms of building the detectors and, uh, and uh, how the uh, LIGO TM uh, put it together and in some interesting stories. So let me add to that that National Science Foundation gave the funding for LIGO um, and uh, we were required to be a detector which is sensitive enough to be able to detect the merger of, for example, two neutron stars from the closest uh, large uh, Gal the galaxy cluster, the uh, Virgo cluster, that's around 25 megaparsec away. And uh, we did that. So finally, that first uh, uh, detector which we built and was running until 2010 was able to, to make such detections. We didn't make such a detection because, well, neutron stars just don't happen to be colliding at such a rate that we would have had more than 10% chance to make a detection during a year of running. So um, there was always a plan that if we 
prove that this detector can be built, the LIGO team proves that this detector can be uh, built and can reach the design sensitivity, we are going to get more funding and build a 10 times more sensitive detector which can see much farther out in the universe, which means we are able to see, because it scales by the volume, if we see 10 times further, we can see 1,000 times more events. Uh, so we got the funding for that, the, the LIGO team uh, got the funding for that, and you know, this large collaboration and, and, and the LIGO laboratory, which is MIT and, and Caltech, uh, got the funding for that and, you know, 60 something institutes also work with them, including Columbia. And this detector was built and we turned it on and we had a large signal right away from colliding black holes. One was, or both were around 30 solar masses. Mm -hmm. So the most enjoyable moment actually is the uh, discovery of the <laughs> of the wave itself. So this is the uh, end of a very hard road uh, when you had uh, the, the 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 prize the, uh, for this hard work with the discovery of the first uh, gravitational waves. No, I, I don't think it's the end. And uh, there are lots of scientists. I, I'm not saying I was not excited about the uh, discovery because I definitely was. Uh, and it was definitely a very enjoyable moment. Um, but I think most scientists love the process. Not the moment of the discovery, but the process what leads to that. So I, I like tinkering in the lab. I like working with the students. I like those small aha moments when I, I discover maybe it's something new for myself or we just solve some crazy thing why something is not working which we thought should be working. Uh, sometimes could be just finding a bug in the code. I know it's ridiculous, but you like those moments because you realize something was wrong and you realize why it's wrong. You learn something from, uh, from it or, or sometimes you, 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 you just find, uh, you know, that uh, your instrument had some hiccup and you realize what that hiccup was. Sometimes even a wrongly connected cable and finding mm -hmm. it and, and you do that together with, with your student and, and uh, uh, you realize the new student learns something at the same time and you're teaching just every day troubleshooting to them. For me, these are enjoyable moments. Yeah. So I, I um, and I think most scientists are like that. So we love the process of discovery or or finding something new, even if they are tiny, but it, it brings some joy and, and some satisfaction to, to, to your days that, that you accomplished something. It, uh, yeah, probably as I understand or as I see it, uh, it's uh, also uh, because of uh, your personality and also because of your uh, background which uh, as in your introduction you, you, you said that you are interested both in the instrument and in the data analysis. So you find uh, joy uh, also in building the instrument uh, with keeping in mind the benefit of this instrument uh, which will be vis uh, visible after you analyze the data produced by this instrument. So uh, now uh, I see or I, I hope we all uh, understand a little bit more about the instrument itself. Can, uh, can you uh, tell a few words about the uh, analysis of the signals and how, how, how you uh, can distinguish uh, uh, one signal from another uh, which arrived to the Earth from the universe. Uh, so how can you, you say, oh, this signal is really something which is a gravitational wave from a black hole or a signal uh, which comes from some unknown sources or, or just noise uh, from the earthquake and so on. So this is the data analysis part as I understand. 
I actually think two things connect. Uh, understanding our own instrument. Actually, in LIGO, we do have something which is called the detector characterization effort. And uh, that's basically understanding what type of noise sources are there uh, in our data. And uh, so we can either veto them or we can fix the instrument so that type of noise won't show up again. Um, but without really understanding our own data, what gives us uh, noise and background uh, noise in, into our instrument, there's no way that we could do good data analysis. So I, I really think the two things uh, come together. Uh, and uh, it's really part of the data analysis effort to have a good knowledge of the detector itself, uh, what's the principle of, of collecting our data, what data channels are there, what are the noise sources. I, I do spend a bit of time of my life on this <laughs> together with the data analysis. In terms of how we find gravitational wave data, currently I am one step beyond that uh, in terms of my data analysis efforts, but I'm, I will tell you a bit more about that, what I'm doing currently and I'm really interested in. But just basically the data analysis efforts, how we imagine that we understand the noises more or less in our data, vetoed everything what, what had to be vetoed, and we are looking at the gravitational wave data stream. Um, in the first hand, the way the, we are looking for this binary, uh, binary events in, in the data, the merger of black holes and, and neutron stars, and, and the preceding inspiring phase for that, is that we actually know what kind of waveforms look, we are looking for. We have great theorists, uh, people who are working in, in numerical relativity as well, so doing simulations like how two black holes with certain masses, certain spins on a given type of orbit, like they could be even eccentric orbits or, or not necessarily just circular orbits, uh, what kind of waveforms they would be releasing. And we are looking for that waveform signature in our data. So imagine that we create a filter, we call it mesh filtering method, and it's running through the, the data itself and we are looking for, for this match. So this is what uh, most of the data analysts are doing in LIGO, looking for uh, uh, finding a, a given type of signal through, through this mesh filtering method. Uh, there are others in, in LIGO who are searching for the unknown unknowns where we don't have a given signature uh, which we are looking for. Basically, we are looking for that is there an extra power in a given frequency regime and we are just dividing up the data for different frequency regimes and if we are finding some type of a signal uh, or not, we don't know, but some type of extra power uh, in, in, the, in the strain data itself. Uh, we can compare that to the regular noise. This is why it's called extra power. And we can make some statement that this type of extra power is more significant than, uh, you know, our, our regular noise floor by let's say three sigma, four sigma, five sigma, how much more significant than the regular noise. If we find these uh, type of signature and, and then we can recover what kind of signature is that. So we can actually recover a waveform from that. Uh, and if we find the same signature in two different detectors, LIGO has two detectors, we also work with Virgo, Koga is coming online, there with LIGO India, but if we see the signature in several detectors, then we can really make a statement how likely it is that similar signatures show up. And we didn't have a filter for them, but we know that these similar signatures show up in two different detectors. So this is the way we are searching for unknown unknowns. Now, in terms of the data effort, which I am 
uh, leading right now. This is a joint search for gravitational waves and high energy neutrinos. Um, so I am taking the metadata, the product from the gravitational wave searches, let's say from these me uh, mesh filter searches. These searches provide a certainly a given event time than a gravitational wave event, let's say two different uh, black holes with given solar masses merged and we detected them in, in our, our detectors. And if it was detected in several detectors, we can also uh, provide a localization for that. So I'm taking this information of event time and localization and something about how significant that event was, what type of event was. And I try to combine that with the uh, data with results from the neutrino detectors measurement. This is uh, a type of uh, multi-messenger astronomy uh, I am working on when we are combining the gravitational waves uh, and the high energy neutrino detectors uh, data stream and we analyze them jointly. Now I know this is still a bit complicated so let me add uh, a few more words here. Uh, how, how is that I have a localization from the gravitational wave data stream and also from the neutrinos? So, and why is it important? So, this goes back to what we started at, that I am really interested in, in, in uh, astrophysics and I am generally looking for if we are finding an astrophysical event in one detector versus the other, uh, what are the chances that these two different measurements actually correlate and it's not and, and, and we have a real detection, so they're coming from the same astrophysical source. And it's not just a chance coincidence of finding something in one detector's data versus the others. So uh, we need localization and we need precise, precise timing information from both detectors. So two things happening, chance coincidence itself in the astrophysical uh, term would mean that two events, two measurements, which we detected here in Earth, would be coming from the same direction on the sky and also around the same time. And we have to evaluate uh, this, that is this something real detection or just happened to overlap by chance. Mm -hmm. And uh, when you have the real detections, uh, I'm, 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 I'm keep thinking about the uh, possible diversity of the signatures, uh, which, uh, as I see, probably help uh, you and the, the theoretical uh, physicists to identify the size uh, of the uh, event and also the distance uh, where it uh, occurred, the distance from the Earth. Uh, is that so that you have a, a diversity of signatures uh, which all fall into the uh, gravitational waves uh, uh, sig signature range and that is what helps you to uh, understand the circumstances of the uh, sources? Is it, yes, is de so? definitely, definitely uh, matters. So I, I like to compare gravitational waves as messengers to, to the high energy neutrinos with which I am also working. So we are detecting gravitational waves and they just talk to us. They are amazing messengers because uh, at least under this binary merger model, uh, what we are searching for and the waveforms we are really looking for, this mesh filtered waveforms, we are getting myriad of information. This is the way, this is why I say they talk to us. We not only uh, detect what were the masses, what were the spins of the, let's say, black holes, or, and 
we also can tell whether they were on a circular orbit, if the spin of one of them was this, the other was maybe this. We can tell these differences. So there are several parameters in the waveform which are inscribed in the waveform, and we can reconstruct that. So I love to say they talk to us. If we have more than one gravitational wave detectors, which is the case, and this is why we need um, one of the reasons why we need more than one, uh, we can also say a wording about the direction where a gravitational wave signature came from. Um, why is that? A gravitational wave detector basically, like our ears, they, they, they see or listen to every, every direction. So we need to triangulate from two, three or more detectors, more is the better, uh, to say something about what direction on the sky a given event uh, arrived from. Uh, and this is very important because this is the window to the universe. This is really to do astronomy uh, with gravitational waves because with their directionality, we may have observed something but as soon as we can give localization, we can tell the rest of the astronomy team to start looking there. Maybe there is a counterpart to this event. So this is what's behind what drives uh, multi-messenger astronomy with gravitational waves uh, themselves. So the high energy neutrinos, I mean, I love them. They are great counterparts. They are co particle counterparts. Uh, they are. Uh, these these uh, neutrinos are emitted by so many different uh, type of uh, uh, messengers, uh, astrophysical sources. Uh, we, we know they are emitted by, for example, blazer. We expected uh, them to be emitted uh, by binary neutron stars. We, we expect to have neutrinos from supernovae, and actually there were neutrinos back in 1987, observed from, from supernova. So we know that they are also amazing messengers and, and so different types, not electromagnetic waves, not uh, gravitational waves. They are uh, uh, very amazing uh, particle counterparts, which are supposed to be emitted around the same time from these sources and arrive around the same time. So we use them as another information in a cosmic puzzle. So these are the differences. One talk to us, the other, the neutrinos talk a bit less to us because the neutrino detectors, and it's, it's not because the detectors are great. Okay, they are amazing. The detector I work with is called Ice Cube. It's at the South Pole. It's a cubic kilometer scale instrumented volume of ice. Uh, and it has lots of optical detectors. And uh, what we are looking for is something so-called Cherenkov uh, radiation when the uh, neutrino comes across uh, and interacts with, with, the, with, 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 with the matter. And we, are, we, we will be getting eventually uh, light from that. And um, uh, this light is which is being detected. But we, what we are really recovering, you know, with the gravitational waves, we see a waveform. What we are recovering here, uh, only, only the flavor of the neutrino, you know, there are electron neutrinos, mu neutrinos, tau neutrinos, and the energy of the neutrino. That's, uh, uh, we can also recover that, and the direction where it came from. We cannot tell, for example, the distance, and I'm glad you brought the distance in. Uh, the gravitational wave detection itself, when we are localizing the event, uh, at the end, we are measuring uh, an amplitude of uh, strain amplitude, and that definitely relates to to what distance, I mean, different detectors, etc. but what distance this uh, gravitational uh, wave source, this event happened. And uh, we do have a distance in the gravitational wave measurement, which we actually, uh, if we find 
which we haven't. I have to say we haven't. We did not have a joint gravitational wave uh, or definitely not a confirmed gravitational wave and high energy neutrino event so far. But if we do, the distance actually have the neutrino detectors to really uh, uh, basically settle down on how far that given neutrino came from. They would be using our, our own results. But there's one more thing. Multi-messenger astronomy, it's not, uh, I mentioned so far, gravitational waves and neutrinos, and that's what I am working on. But certainly there are the electromagnetic counterparts as well. And I do think if there really neutrinos, it's very likely we'd be also seeing some, or we would have a chance to see electromagnetic counterparts for that. So if we have a, even a non, not very significant, joint event, which we see like you know, around the threshold gravitational wave data. And a neutrino, which is energetic, but we are not really sure whether it's truly astrophysical or it's a background event. But if we pull these two events together, they would be somewhat significant, but we wouldn't be able to tell whether they are really significant, or we can tell the astronomers. This is the joint's localization. We have the distance from the gravitational wave measurement. Use your telescope. Look up the sky right now as soon as possible and look for optical signatures in that direction. And actually, we have been giving out these triggers uh, to astronomers. And sometimes it happened they found something, but then at the end, they were not very significant. But I do think that the first detection, a joint detection between gravitational waves and high, ener and high energy neutrinos may co come on a way that it will really become only significant if the electromagnetic uh, counterpart is there. And then we add lots of things which happen to be, you know, two things happening at, at the same time from the same direction is less significant when, when we have three different uh, detections. Again, same time, same directions. And we can also ask our serious colleagues that, does this make sense? Is this the right type of, of, of astrophysical source? Excellent. Uh, this is very interesting because uh, uh, now, uh, as I see, uh, this is a, a, a new uh, age, a new era of mapping the universe. Uh, you know, first maybe people were looking up the sky and, and see the, uh, the the stars, and then the astro, astro, astronomers were uh, looking with the, the tel telescopes and, and, and so on. Uh, but uh, this uh, was, uh, in my understanding, a, a bit of a static uh, description of the universe and 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 with this new knowledge and with, you, with the new data you have uh, you are able also to to uh, to, 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 to build a, 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 a space time map of uh, of the universe so the dynamics how the universe were uh, uh, evolving how it developed and how the uh, the, the dynamics in it. And uh, the, what I see, this is probably the first uh, years or the first steps of uh, mapping uh, the past of the universe with the help of the uh, detection of the gravitational waves. Uh, 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 I have here many questions in mind. Uh, the, the first one is maybe that uh, how, how much uh, in the past how many light years, for instance, if you want to express it in light years, uh, how many light years in the past you were able to go back uh, uh, in, 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 in time and uh, uh, how much a portion, uh, yeah, universe is endless, but uh, how much of the known uh, universe uh, you uh, will be able to detect in the, uh, in the, in the, in the near uh, future? Sorry. These are two questions. <laughs> no. Very difficult questions, yeah. probably, but uh, you know, these, no, no, these are questions which are interest me and I hope also uh, interest our audience. And, uh, yeah. How far we can uh, see back. So we finished our last science run between LIGO and Virgo and back in 2020, just as, as COVID started. We had to turn off the detectors and we were able at that point to routinely detect merging black holes of tens of solar masses um, uh, from order of six gigaparsec. 
uh, you know, giga, for, giga means 10 to the 9. If we want to uh, convert it to light years, we have to multiply it by 3 or 4, somewhere like that. So order of, order of uh, 20 uh, times 10 to the 9 light years. That's what we are talking about, if we are uh, talking about light years. How far we see merging black holes? We don't. We are not seeing any, seeing merging neutron stars to that distance. It's much much lower because they have much lower uh, mass, and uh, our sensitivity for that type of objects is it's much lower. We are restarting our detector. At the current plan is March 2023, and we are gonna see a bit further. And, you know, even if we see like 30% further or so, which is, uh, could be somewhere we don't know exactly what sensitivity we will turn back on. But uh, let's say roughly 30% uh, further, it, it also means we are going to see even up to 10 times more event uh, if we are, mm -hmm. you know, lucky. So there is still a few years before in the in the planetarium, uh, the uh, astronomers will be able to uh, display on the map of the Milky Way or the known universe exactly. the events of the of the black hole uh, mergings and so on. We have 95 events, and you can even find papers out there which uh, certainly show those 95 events on the on, so on the same the map. So we are going to have a, a certainly a transient uh, map of the transient gravitational wave mm -hmm. sky. That that is definitely uh, something you you see this for example the uh, gamma ray burst sky. You can you probably also see in the microwave background. So we we definitely will be able to provide such a map. And and with those 95 events, we do have such a map. You were asking. Uh, me about cosmological scales. So the current detectors are not sensitive enough. I mean, this is already fairly cosmological effects are in 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 the data, especially for at six gigaparsec. But uh, in terms of see the you know black hole hole formation rate and what is the mass spectrum of of uh, of black holes. Uh, from from the gravitational wave uh, uh, data, uh, it will require a new instrument. So, in terms of being able to see these tens of solar uh, uh, masses, uh, black holes colliding from much earlier uh, time in our universe, we will need. A, new detector. There's a plan in the US, it's called uh, Cosmic Explorer. There is another plan uh, by Europeans, it's called the Einstein Telescope. So in the not funded, is the Cosmic Explorer is definitely not funded. Einstein Telescope is, is, is a bit ahead. Um, it's uh, According to the plans, they would start sometimes in the mid-2030s, we will see. I mean, it's really funding dependent at the moment. But they would be able to see uh, these type of black holes to the earliest uh, time when black holes were actually <laughs> forming pairs. And, and we would see the full uh, uh, gravitational wave sky and in transients back in in cosmological uh, means uh, with these type of sources. Thank you very much. So this is a, this is a process uh, which uh, will still be ongoing in the next uh, uh, decades. And I, I was very uh, also happy to uh, learn a lot of things and also that you enjoy this process. So I, I wish you to uh, keep enjoying this moment uh, uh, of, uh, of moments of, uh, of research for the uh, coming years and, and, and beyond. And uh, I thank you uh, and thank uh, the audience for the listening. And I think we learned a lot of interesting things from you. And I personally enjoyed very much this uh, conversation. And thank you very much for, for coming to the Institute of Advanced Studies in Kursk in Hungary and uh, sharing your knowledge and experiences uh, with us and our, our audience. Thank you very much. Thank you for the invitation. And it was a pleasure. Thank you.